All righty. Well, thank you for coming in. And uh, again, we're third week here. We're looking at this uh, lesson on tithing. It's an issue that we wanted to cover just because of the confusion uh, that exists on this issue. And uh, to give you some instruction from God's word with respect to this and so that we can obey the Lord faithfully and honor him in this. And so as we have been the last couple of weeks, uh, hopefully we can cover some good ground today. This will be the last week of this lesson. And then next week we'll begin a study on, uh, I know it sounds a little highfalutin, covenant theology, dispensational theology. We're going to break that down. Uh, There's also confusion about that. I think that'll be a really healthy study uh, for our church. It'll take us many, many weeks to go through that. But I, I... Uh, committing to the Lord that you'll enjoy that. It'll be a good, healthy, biblical study, and you'll get um, just more appreciation for God's word from it. And so we look forward to doing that study with you. And that that subject comes up frequently. Um, It may not for you. I know for me, it it didn't for a long time. I just was sort of content with with what I knew not to get into all that. But uh, it is a question. It's an issue that comes up quite frequently. And so we want to take some time and go through it. And I think it'll benefit you. It'll, it includes you know, sort of the way that we look at scripture, but also eschatology, a study of end times and uh, how that plays into all this. So it's going to be a good study. But we're finishing up, hopefully, maybe today, uh, maybe next week, finishing up this lesson on tithing. And um, give us an update now on where we are so far. We looked at a, a couple of things last couple of weeks. One that the uh, Old Testament clearly teaches tithing under the Mosaic law, under the Mosaic covenant. And so give me some principles now uh, from that. We also covered that uh, outside of the Mosaic law, outside the Mosaic covenant, tithing is also taught in Genesis 14, or the principle there is given when Abraham from the spoils of war tithes to Melchizedek, priest of God most high, right? And then we saw in Genesis chapter 28, where Jacob, uh, in response, in a worshipful response for all that God uh, was providing to Jacob and the promises that God was making, uh, reiterating again the Abrahamic covenant to Jacob, how Jacob responded by worshiping God, and part of that included the tithe. And so give me some principles now that pertain to all three of those. We have the Mosaic covenant, we have Abraham, Genesis 14, Jacob, Genesis 28. What are some principles that we took from those accounts? Just shout them out. Yes. Tithe must be brought into the storehouse, and that's got an application for us. We'll talk about that. Something else. Very good, brother. Pardon me? Thankfulness. That it was a, a testimony of their gratefulness or thankfulness to God for what God had provided them. Jacob even said, all I have has been provided by God. Worship. That they, it was always a part of worship. That they tithe, they gave as a part of their worship to God. Really, really good point. Yes. Oh, and fear the Lord. Yes. The Lord instituted tithing, he says, in the Mosaic Covenant, instituted that to teach the people of God to fear God. Uh, We could say, add to that, to trust God, God's provision that the Lord provides. What else? Pardon me? The tenth. Tithe means the tenth. Very good. It gives us uh, an amount to tithe. They gave a tenth. And it's interesting that before the law, Genesis, uh, Genesis 14, 28, that Abraham gave a tenth, that Jacob gave a tenth, and then a tenth was commanded under the uh, Mosaic law. What else? All very, very good principles. Yes. Yes. So it was tithed, the tithe was given Um, considering spiritual authority uh, when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. We're going to look at that more today, but very good point. The tithe that was given under the Mosaic law was given to spiritual authority. The people tithed to the Levites. The Levites tithed to the priests. priests. So yeah, very good. Someone had their hand up? Something else? Yes. Yes, very good. First fruits, we went all the way back to Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel. And how Abel, in his acceptable sacrifice, offered the first fruits of his flock, uh, the firstborn of the herds, or the fatlings, the best of the flock. Very, very good. We're to offer our best, our first. All right, so all good principles, right? We'll talk about those some more. So one question that we wanted to ask, answer, ask and answer, uh, is this issue of whether or not in the Old Testament that tithing then was prescriptive in the sense that all Christians are to do this today, or was tithing merely descriptive for their particular circumstances at that particular time? And I want to give you in the course of this, and we're transitioning into hopefully today what the New Testament teaches on this, 
But one way to determine whether a truth in Scripture is simply descriptive for a specific circumstance at that specific time, or whether a truth is prescriptive, this is something I need to obey, something I need to follow the Lord in, uh, there are ways that you can determine that from a text that you're going to study. Now, we've taught um, over the years how to do an inductive Bible study uh, of the Scripture. When you want to take a passage of Scripture, inductive Bible study is good because induction takes you from uh, observing the text to interpreting the text, and then that often overlooked, often neglected part of applying the text. So if you're going to do an inductive Bible study, you want to know what the text clearly says, uh, and then you want to be able to apply it. Now, if we're going to do an inductive Bible study, oh, this board is not in good shape. I mean, that's a useless activity, trying to erase all that. So I'm just going to write over it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, forgive us. Um, if you're going to do an inductive Bible study, we need to uh, understand first what the text said to that audience at that time. So you have their context. And this is a, a picture that came out of, uh, if any of you have studied grasping God's word before, you remember the picture of their context, okay? So they live in their day and age, all their houses, okay? Here's the, the people. Okay? <laughs> forgive me not an artist. Um, then you have our text, our day and age, okay? Here's our people. <laughs> heavier than the people. <laughs> so, <laughs> forgive me again. Was that? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm expecting, yeah. Um, okay, so now, what you, do, what you do, if you're going to do Bible interpretation or Bible study, inductive study, good to just read the Bible, right? You need to be reading your Bible. As much as I study the Bible, I still just read every day. And I just want to learn the Bible by reading. But then it, it's really helpful to zero in on particular texts of Scripture, like we're doing in John, you know, verse by verse, looking at specific passages and really digging out the gems, all those diamonds that lie there under the surface and how they apply to you. And so in an inductive Bible study, the first place that you go, or first place that you start, is observing the text. And in observing the text, uh, in this specific question we're asking today with respect to tithing, we wanna know what the text would have meant to that audience at that time. And so if we read Genesis 14 or Genesis 28, uh, what is that account? What did that account communicate to those who would have read that or heard that at that time? in that day and age, and we've got to determine that meaning first. Then we do, once we have that understood, we cross what they call the principalizing bridge, okay? I'm not even going to write that down. You'll know, that's a principalizing bridge, okay? And what that means is um, we have to look at the two audiences, okay? Their audience at that time, our audience at our time, and we need to determine what's the same, what's the difference, and what's different between them and us? Um, give me some examples of differences between those audiences and us today. Just throw them out. Yes. Language is one. Very good. Culture. Big one. Covenant. Yeah, they've got a different covenant. Very good. So we've got differences between their culture and our culture, that audience and our audience. So there are going to be things that in their culture at their time that will apply to them because it was at that time to them that won't apply to us. And so certain idioms or practices or those kinds of things, if you were, uh, a text was written to under the Mosaic covenant, are we under the Mosaic covenant today? No, we under, we're under a new covenant, a better covenant. So would those specific Mosaic covenant issues apply to us today? No, ceremonially they wouldn't, okay? So there's a difference between covenants and that's gonna, apply, that's gonna affect what applies to us, what doesn't. And again, this is important. It goes to answering the question on something like tithing, whether tithing applies to the Christian today, is what are the principles that carry forward from that teaching at that time to us today in our context? So now, in light of that, we got to cross the principalizing bridge. I want you to um, give me applicable, if you think about this, you, um, and you brothers that are experienced in this, help us out applicable differences and similarities between all three circumstances. Here's the three circumstances we're looking at. Before the law, Genesis 14, Genesis 28. Under the law, the Mosaic Covenant. And now after the law, our context today, okay? 
after the Mosaic Covenant, our new covenant. We're looking at those three circumstances. I want you to throw out, let's look at differences first. Give me differences between Genesis 1428, before the law, under the law, and after the law. Give me some differences in those three circumstances. Let me give you an example of one. One difference is, under the Mosaic law, they had a temple. Before, no temple, no tabernacle. After, no temple, no tabernacle. And so under the Mosaic law, there's a difference, right? There are people that say that tithing only applied under the Mosaic covenant because there was a temple that needed to be supported. And so that was the only reason for the tithe. So there's a difference is a temple. Nolan, do you have one? Yeah. Very good. Yeah, so in our context, all of those types and shadows from the Old Testament have been fulfilled, have been clearly revealed now in Christ. We have a clear revelation. Uh, in progressive revelation, it's been made known in Christ. So all those types and shadows point forward. Very good. Yeah. The government, they have a government. Very good. Yeah, very good. And neither were they under Abraham in Genesis time. I mean, Abraham was a patriarch. He ruled, if you will, the men, servants, the family that he had under him. So yeah, very good. Something else that you can think of. Let me give you another one. And I know this is a very difficult question, but you'll see where I'm going with this. Uh, one they would say is that Abraham gave his tithe uh, with the spoil, to the spoils of war. Abraham just won what he had, one of those possessions uh, in war. And so he gave his tithe as the spoils of war. Well, in, under the Mosaic Covenant, it's a different because they gave their tithes from all that they had been given by God to sort of a tax for the temple, if you will, and which is different in our day. We earn our incomes from the jobs that we have. So those are differences. Um, give me the things that are the same about all three. And here's where the rubber meets the road. With respect to the tithe, what are the same between all three circumstances or covenants? I think Chase, and I'll come back over and get. Amen. Amen. So across all three circumstances, we're all worshiping, right? We worship God. Abraham and Jacob did. They did under the Mosaic Law. We do today. Yeah, very good. The people of God. So um, Abraham, Jacob, and Genesis, the people of God and what they did under the Mosaic Covenant, the Israelites in the wilderness or in the land, and then us today, the church. Tenth. It's a tenth across all three, right? Across all three, it's tenth, tenth, tenth. Somebody else? Okay. <laughs> very good. People of God gave. Very good, very good. So you see how this works now. And you could take principles, and we will in just a moment, across all three circumstances. And across all three circumstances, the principles continue. So let's, um, and that's what we do when we cross that principalizing bridge. The things that are different don't apply. The things that are same do. Let me give you one thought or one example of this would be um, head coverings. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Why is it today that women in the church aren't required to wear head coverings? Can somebody give a quick like ex explanation of that? From 1 Corinthians 11, the issue of head coverings, Sergio? Well, culture, yeah, the culture is different. They did wear head coverings back then. There's a specific issue behind the head coverings. What, what's the, what was the issue? Why were women not wearing head coverings in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? And that was looked at as sin. Very good, very good. Okay, so now we look at the, the two audiences, that audience in the first century, the church at Corinth, and then our uh, circumstances today. The difference is that back at that time, the way that someone, a woman, might have expressed rebellion against God's prescribed program is by wearing a head covering, or not wearing a head covering, rather. In their culture at that time, it was appropriate to wear a head covering, and women would rebel by not wearing a head covering, uh, they would shave their hair, cut their hair really short. Men would grow their hair really long. It was a sign of rebellion. Fast forward to our culture now, it's not considered 
rebellious not to wear a, all of you women in here would be rebellious right now. It's not considered to be rebellious not to wear a head covering. Um, we express our rebellion. Miss Sharma is the only godly woman in the room. So, <laughs> so it's, not, <laughs> um, it's, not a, it's not an expression of rebellion today not to wear a, a head covering. We have other ways that we express rebellion, right? So for our, con the principle that carries over the bridge is that principle that we're not to rebel against God-ordained authority, God-ordained, you know? That's the principle that carries forward. That's what we're to obey. So now think about it in terms of tithing. Those principles that carry forward are those things that transcend our circumstances or transcend those individual time periods. And those are those things that you just listed, that it's a worship, it's an act of worship. It's an act, uh, it's giving a tenth, the tenth transcends. It's in Genesis. It's also under Moses. We'll see in a moment. It's in the New Testament, a tenth. Um, it's uh, done, the Lord instituted it to fear the Lord. Abraham feared the Lord. So he gave to Melchizedek, the priest of God most high. The children of Israel taught to fear the Lord through the giving of the tithe. Um, we're to fear the Lord today, obey the Lord, obey his commandments. It's robbery not to, we see in Malachi chapter three. So those things transcend. You see those principles? So now let me ask you the question then. In light of that one truth only, are those principles then descriptive only for Abraham in that particular circumstance at that particular time? Only for Jacob in his particular circumstance at his particular time? Only for the children of Israel under the Mosaic covenant for their circumstance at their time? Or... Do those principles transcend all three circumstances and would also be for the Christian today? Right, okay, so it's those principles are those things that are prescribed for us today. If it was descriptive only, then the tithe would have gone away with Moses. If it was descriptive only, then that one particular circumstance with Genesis, uh, with Abraham in Genesis 14, wouldn't have any application for us today. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that all scripture given by inspiration of God and is profitable for instruction, for correction, for rebuke. So if that passage in Genesis 14, if the passage in Genesis 28 is profitable for us, when you get there, if you were going to study that passage and you're gonna preach it to the people, right? You're gonna get up and you're gonna preach Genesis 14. What are the principles that you would draw out of the text that you would teach the people? It's right to worship God in that way, that it's right to give a tenth, that pulls through, um, that it's right to fear the Lord, that the Lord has instituted giving as a response to all that he's given us. I mean, you get all of those principles out of that text and they would all apply to us. The scripture is profitable in that way. So not, does that begin to answer the question some, whether it's prescriptive or descriptive? Okay. So that's one way to do that is through that sort of inductive Bible study, drawing out the principles uh, is clearly um, prescriptive. Now, let me give you a few examples of that and how this works. Look at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. And um, let's look at the teaching of Christ here. In Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, uh, the teaching here specifically is about divorce. But I want you to see how Christ does this. And then I want you to see Christ doing this with a teaching on divorce and how that applies to tithing. There, so you get into studying this issue, many, many objections. They all wanna isolate tithing to specific points in time. None of those principles carry through. And so tithing doesn't apply to the Christian today. We wanna faithfully obey the Lord. And so we need to faithfully consider how Christ teaches the law. And here specifically with reference to divorce in Matthew chapter 19 and look beginning at verse one, okay? Beginning at verse one. Uh, it says in verse one, now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Here's the question presented to Christ. And this is a question that deals with doctrine. It deals with uh, God's law. And we're going to look at how Christ answers this. He answered them, verse 4, and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, stop right there and let me ask you, where does that come from? From Genesis. Before the law? 
right? Okay, not during the law, not after. It came from Genesis before the law. Christ takes this issue of divorce, goes all the way back to Genesis. Now, does Genesis say, you shall not divorce your wife? No. It, we have a principle here derived from the text that God has joined together, man and woman, and that let not man separate what God has joined together, okay? So we take a principle. This is what Christ does in teaching on divorce here. Takes the principle out of the text in Genesis before the law and applies that to us today, okay? Actually, it applies it to them in the first century. We take that same principle and apply it to us today. We're transcending all kinds of time periods, all right? But then look what he does, verse six. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Verse seven, they said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? So now we're jumping forward from Genesis into the Mosaic covenant. Look at how Christ responds. He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. He permitted them under the Mosaic law. That's Deuteronomy chapter 24, where Moses permits divorce. I encourage you to look at that in verses one through five there, all right? He says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, and now Jesus clarifies the law, um, gives us the true sense and meaning of it so we're not confused, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So now, look at how, what we have set up here in the teaching of Jesus. We have the principles drawn from the Genesis account with respect to marriage and divorce. We then have... Uh, principles drawn from the Mosaic law with respect to marriage and divorce. Now Jesus in the New Testament clarifying, expanding the law, teaching it as it clearly is in the first century and in all of those places, we can fast forward to our context and take the principles that apply directly from here. Very clear from Christ's word. We're not to divorce except for cases of adultery or desertion, death. We'll learn that in other parts of scripture. But you see how that works though. All three segments, okay? The same is true of tithing. Now listen, Christ did not abrogate the law. Christ came to what? Fulfill the law. He doesn't do away with the law. He came that every word would be fulfilled. So he doesn't set himself up here and start canceling out laws from the past. He doesn't say that Moses doesn't apply anymore. He doesn't say that that account in Genesis doesn't apply to us today. He clarifies, it does apply and it applies in this way. Exactly the same with tithing. There are those that will say that because the New Testament, we're gonna prove this wrong in a moment, because the New Testament doesn't teach tithing, that means that tithing is not for the Christian today because the New Testament doesn't teach it. The New Testament does teach it, but that's a wrong way of looking at the scripture. It should be, shouldn't it, that just because the New Testament doesn't say a lot, that we start abandoning stuff the New Testament isn't. The Old Testament said it, and here Jesus is doing the same thing. The Old Testament said it in Genesis with respect to creation. The Old Testament said it under Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 24, and now Christ is saying it in Matthew chapter 19 here. So Jesus is not abrogating anything. He's clarifying, expanding on what the scripture says, expounding on what the scripture says, not doing away with it, okay? We looked at that with the... Um, head covering issue. We also have that from uh, the role of women. Uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Just another example of this very same thing. And this is the way that we need to look at scripture when we study our Old Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. Now there is a context to, that, to this for them at that time in the church at Ephesus. There was a context to this law or commandment before, and there's a context for us today. It says in chapter two, verse 11, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For, for now here's that's what Paul was commanding at that time, okay? At that time in their context, that's what Paul was commanding. But here's the basis for the command, verse 13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. He goes all the way back to creation again, all the way back to Genesis. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was being deceived, fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she'll be saved in childbearing. Um, so we have the same exact thing happening again. We have the account in Genesis that is given to support this principle that we have 
male authority, male leadership in the church or male um, headship, so to speak, over the family, um, that Eve was Adam's helper. We got those principles set up for us in Genesis. Then you fast forward under the Mosaic law, certainly the case. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 18 is where, um, if you will, in Israel, male leadership under the Mosaic covenant was established with Moses and Aaron and his sons and their grandsons, the men leading the people. Then you fast forward into the New Testament church in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Here's male leadership and the reason for it again. And we fast forward into our context and it applies again. So you see, even though each of those contexts, right, are subtly different for various reasons, principles apply in every single circumstance that transcend each of those circumstances and apply today. Uh, that's why it wouldn't be right today, no matter what people say, that... Um, it's okay to ordain women into the ministry. Uh, those principles transcend all those different circumstances, and these are the principles that are brought forward. Now, you, you could do that on your own with a good study of your Bible, looking inductively at each of those circumstances, finding the differences between culture and circumstance, and then finding those things that are the same that transcend, and those things that are the same, those principles apply today, just like we did with tithing, okay? We looked at the differences, those things don't apply. Culture, covenant, those kinds of things uh, are gonna impact what applies to us today. Then we looked at the similarities, the things that are the same. And from those things that are the same, we draw out the principles that apply to us today. It works the same way with tithing, okay? Never abrogated. That means that those principles apply to the Christian today. So now, in summary, give me those principles, you know, specific, specifically talking about tithing now, from all three that are the same, just start shouting them out. Those principles, we'll summarize this for you too in a paper very soon. Give me those principles that apply to the Christian today because they apply in all, apply in all circumstances. What are some of those? Worship, 10%. <laughs> Bring it into the storehouse, yes. Fear of the Lord, praise the Lord, yep. An act of faith, trusting in the Lord, yes. See that in all circumstances. Some other similarities cheerful giver. Amen. First fruits. Yes. Yes, Isabel. Very good. That's an excellent point. <laughs> Principles. What else? Yeah, it's tithes and offerings, right? Very good. That we're to bring offerings too. Thankfulness done out of thankfulness to the Lord, gratefulness to the Lord for what he's given us. So all that you see all these things. Yes, Chase. Yeah, Malachi chapter three, very good. It's a trust, it goes back to that trusting the Lord. The Lord will provide, yeah, amen. Okay, so we see all those, now those are all well and good. You can, even in your own study of the Bible, in each of those contexts, you can draw out those principles for yourself that all apply. Now, we've sort of gone around our elbow to get to our thumb the last three weeks to, to get to that point. But you see how simple that is? It's not rocket surgery, right? I mean, you, you, uh, those are things you see in each of those texts. Principles, they're very simple. When, you know, Tom, I think it was last week when Tom just said that uh, it's an act of worship. Yes, I mean, that's, that's just nailing the, you can't say it any more clearly than that. That's what it is. It's, that's the way that we worship God. It's a part of our worship of the Lord. And that transcends all of those different circumstances. And that's why it is prescriptive. It's commanded. It's necessary, required of the Christian today to worship the Lord in the same way and to worship with the tithe related to all those principles that get carried forward, okay? So now, hopefully that issue is, in that sense, is settled to some degree for you. Would it be safe to say, too, that um, it was always given to someone or a group of people that were ordained as spiritual authority? Very good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good. So now, um, to Mike's point, scripture is not just to learn stuff, okay? Scripture is to be applied. It's information for transformation. We're to live according to scripture. So what we have to be able to do is we have to be able to take what the scripture teaches, right? And then apply it to us and obey it and live it. And so if you're going to answer a question, like let's say um, you want to ask yourself, okay, is it appropriate to uh, take my tithe and for me to administer that as I desire. So I'm gonna give it to this parachurch organization. 
that's a question in and of itself. There are no such thing in scripture as parachurch organizations are all under the scope of the church. So would it be right to give a tithe to a parachurch? No, <laughs> you, could, you know, um, you have the issue of uh, where does my tithe go? Back to Nolan's point about the storehouse that we can take those principles that the tithe is for the Lord. The tithe is to God. We tithe as an act of worship, but the tithe was given to Melchizedek before the law, under the law given to who? Levites and Levites gave their tenth to the priests and they distributed that in the New Testament church comes into the church. So yeah, when we talk about giving um, in the New Testament, tithing in the New Testament, it's all given under the umbrella of the local church and then the local church becomes the, the dispenser of that according to need, if you will. So all those questions, you know, again, you get answered by looking at those principles that apply and knowing if you settle in your heart and mind that okay, yes, Tithing applies because the scripture teaches it. And I can take principles from the law under Moses. I can take principles from Genesis 14, Genesis 28, Genesis 4. I can take principles from the New Testament. Then when you begin to look at passages like Malachi chapter 3, that where the Lord says, bring all of your tithes, all of your offerings into the storehouse, and he rebukes them for not doing that, threatens to judge them for not doing that. Then you can say, okay, well, this is that part which applies to me. I'm to tithe. It's an act of faith and act of trust in the Lord, and I'm to bring it to the church. You know what I mean? It's, it's like you can begin to take those principles and apply them that way. And that's what we're to do. Um, we're to apply those uh, for us that we can properly obey. Okay, so let's look at a few New Testament texts now where we've got time uh, to show again that it's clearly taught in the New Testament. So one, we have that uh, determining whether this is prescriptive or just descriptive. You have that application of principles, right? You're gonna find those principles that transcend these circumstances. Uh, and those principles apply. Secondly, it's taught by example prior to the law, taught under the law, taught after the law, okay? And that's always a good um, test for whether something is prescriptive or descriptive. Let me give you another example, just pops to mind, is the example of um, foot washing. Why is it now? Jesus says it is John chapter 10, um, I believe that's right, where Christ uh, puts on a towel and he uh, stoops down to wash the disciples' feet and he says to them, go to John chapter 10, let's look at that just very, very quickly. Oh, 13, thank you, brother, sorry. And look um, down at, uh, just we'll start at verse seven. You know, he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet. He says in verse seven, Jesus answered and said to them, what I'm doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Uh, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash, you have no part with me. So Peter says, wash all of me, <laughs> right? Um, so in verse 12, so when Jesus had washed their feet, taken his garments, sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Okay, so now there are many churches, several churches, that still prescribe to foot washing as an ordinance of the church. There's baptism, there's the Lord's Supper, and there's foot washing. Why is that not biblical to include foot washing among the ordinances of the church? Can you think about that for a moment? Yeah, we've got an example here. Christ is washing their feet, in John chapter 13. And he says, giving you an example for you to do. So why is it that we don't foot wash? Think about our principal um, conversation a second ago. It's not, not easy, right? I mean, you've got to think, got to think. That's one way to look at it. Yeah, Christ is making that point to them there, though, too, that they're clean. Yeah, Christian? Yes. Yes, very good. Right. Somebody else had their hand up? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, very true. Very true. Yes. Today I need my socks washed, so somebody else said <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So very good. So we see, we start looking at, yes, <laughs> yes. We see some, some things being clarified. Okay. So now um, take the two points. Let's put those together a little bit in that. Um, what was the point that Jesus Christ was trying to make? What was the, the principle that is the point of the passage? And that's a pic, it's a picture of humility. It's a picture of serving your brother. The Lord gives us an example of how to serve one. Another. He even says there, look at the, the text, look at, um, Verse 15, for I have given you an example. An example of what? Servant leadership. Uh, serving your brother and sister, loving your brother and sister. Uh, an example of humility. We see all of that in Christ. So the point is that we're to be an example of humility. We're to serve one another. There are many ways to do that besides foot washing. You wash someone's clothes. <laughs> so, uh, you can serve your brother and sister in that way. And he says, look at that. It says, uh, giving you as an, an example that you should do just like I have done, exactly as I have done. No, do as I have done. Uh, I have washed your feet, Jesus is saying, as a picture of humility, a picture of servant, um, being servant. You're to do the same in loving your brother and sister. That's why it's not, again, you can go back to that text. You can pull that all apart. You can see all those intricacies. That's why we don't do foot washing in the church today, okay? We take the principle that applies. The principle that applies is the example of the humility of Christ, the example that we're to serve one another, we're to show that much love for one another, and we can do that in many ways, not just foot washing, right? So it's not an ordinance, no one. Very good, yeah. You have the Lord's Supper and Baptism all over the New Testament, right? Lord's Supper all over the place. Um, foot washing is mentioned here, and that's it. So yeah, one of those principles is, is that, especially when you've got a circumstance like this and the wording there in chapter 13, because of all those things, you would want, if foot washing was to be an ordinance, you'd expect to see it in mul multiple other places. And because we do not, again, we, we see that as descriptive for this one particular moment in time that Christ is teaching this principle, but not prescriptive for Christians today or Christians throughout the New Testament. Amen. Yeah, amen. Yeah, examples all over the place of them, Paul, doing exactly what uh, Jesus is doing here. You know, Paul, I mentioned in the sermon um, today, um, Paul's comment in Philippians chapter 2, when he says, I'm a drink offering poured out in sacrifice and service to others. Um, we're to be a drink offering, and that's an offering to the Lord. Now, we're to be a drink offering to the Lord poured out in service to others. This, Paul's is a picture of this very principle that Christ is, is teaching here. So, okay. So now all that's making sense. Go to Matthew chapter 23 with me, Matthew chapter 23. And uh, let's look at where tithing is taught in the New Testament. And as we look at these texts, um, you know, a couple of texts, not overly clear. One particular text, very clear. But as we look at the, the text, um, again, you can't come to the text with too many presuppositions. Some presupp presuppositions are fine and okay, but you, have, you can't come with an agenda. You just need to let the text sort of speak for itself. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, um, here's what Jesus said. He's rebuking the scribes and Pharisees. And listen to uh, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Now let's talk about that for a moment because he specifically mentions the tithe here in Matthew chapter 23. For starters, uh, the objection often is he's strictly teaching or talking to five scribes and Pharisees fribes and square fees um, <laughs> only. That doesn't apply to anyone else. But if you look back at the beginning of chapter 23, Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples saying, the scribes and Pharisees, he's rebuking the scribes and Pharisees, but he's doing that for the benefit of the multitudes and his disciples that are sitting around listening. So he's teaching. He's teaching the multitudes, he's teaching his disciples, and he's rebuking the scribes and Pharisees. So when you get to verse 23, you pay tithe of mitten, cumin, and anise. Um, 
Jesus didn't condemn the Pharisees for uh, tithing, for their legalistic tithing. He condemned the scribes and Pharisees for their hypocritical uh, tithing, their heartless ritualistic tithing. He said, these you should have done. He, he in verse 23, um, you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin and have neglected the way to your matters of law, justice, and mercy, and faith. These paying those tithes of mint, anise, and cumin, you ought to have done, these you ought to have done without leaving the others, or these you ought to have done, mercy, law, or justice, mercy, and faith, those you ought to have done without leaving the others that tithe of mint, anise, and cumin undone. So give me some principles you get from, what is he saying here? What is he saying with respect to the tithe, with respect to what they're doing? Give me some principles you see there. Yeah, you know that they're, they're, they're using it as a work of the law. They're trying to do, do works to get them into heaven and it's just turned into a mindless ritual for them. Yeah, no one? Amen. Very good. Amen. So he's not saying here uh, that tithing should not be done. What he's saying is that uh, tithing should not proceed from a ritualistic, heartless, hypocritical worship, but tithing should proceed from the same heart from which justice, mercy, and faith flow. It should be heart done from the heart. Um, so again, he's not abrogating tithing He's clarifying how tithing should be done. It should be done from the heart, uh, heart worship to the Lord. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were going to say something further. Sorry, brother. Um, in other words, it, it should be internal out of the heart, not simply external the way they're doing it. Now, unless you're going to look at this, this text with an agenda, you can't escape the fact that Jesus Christ is teaching tithing here. You can make all kinds of excuses. Well, he's just talking about that because it was a mosaic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could say that or he's just teaching scribes and Pharisees. Yeah, you could say that, but he's teaching the multitudes. He's teaching his disciples at the same time he's rebuking them. He's talking about heart holiness. He upholds that tithing should be done, but it should come from the same heart as justice, mercy, and faith. Uh, should be part of heart worship to God. So there's simply, here's a text, Matthew 23, 23, where Christ specifically mentions tithing and he does nothing at all to abrogate it and does everything to uphold it as being something that comes from the heart, heart worship to God. So I don't, seems pretty clear, right? Okay, any comments or input on any of that that can help? Yeah, brother. Pardon me? Before the cross, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, and it's interesting that um, a lot of dispensationalists that, that tend to think along those lines. But again, we go, we're about to look at something after the cross. But um, again, Christ is upholding this teaching and he's upholding it for the disciples and the multitudes that are around him, clarifying the law. The, the, the same dispensation, not all dispensationalists are bad. This is an extreme we're talking about. But that same dispensational way of approaching the text would lead others to say that the Beatitudes don't apply. You know, you can't do anything with Matthew 5 because... That's before the cross. It's for Jews, not for Christians. It's the same people that would eventually, if you follow that logic out, would start chopping up their pieces of the Bible. That letter to the Hebrews doesn't apply to us at all today because it was to the Hebrews, you know, or you can't use any of the gospels. We're Christians in the New Testament church, so all we need to read are Paul's epistles, right? Um, it's just that hyper dispensationalism that uh, is heresy. It'll lead you to hell and take most of the Bible out of your hands. Um, so... Uh, okay, let's look at the next text. Look really quickly at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And this is the place where um, you have the tax collector or the uh, publican, and the Pharisee in the temple. Luke chapter 18. And, you know, again, it's just, it's a small text that mentions it. Verse 9, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. 
Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you, I'm not like this other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And so the objection is, is this is a wicked Pharisee who's tithing, tithing is legalistic and no longer applies to the Christian today. And so we wipe that out. It's not the point of the passage, not the point of the parable and um, not what's being said here. Um, it goes back to our same issue from Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, in that the Pharisees were doing these things ritualistically and heartlessly toward God. They were hypocrites. And so again, you can't use Luke 18 to say it doesn't apply because the Pharisee was legalistically tithing, simply making the point that the Pharisee was a hypocrite and you have this tax collector who couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. The tax collector was the one who was humble, okay? So again, you have to look at the principles there. Let's look at the last passage together, and this is Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. In Hebrews chapter 7, I encourage you to spend some time on yourself because uh, this has implications and connections here that I think are very, very important for this particular uh, issue. And you're gonna, you, have, you, know, you have to put all these things together uh, when you study your Bible. You have to go to the various texts. You have to study those texts individually. You have to take from those particular texts um, principles that apply. You have to look at that teaching across covenants, across books of the Bible, across centuries, sometimes across millennia. Uh, you have to look at that under the law. You have to look at that in the church age. You have to look at what the New Testament says, what Jesus Christ says. To so start looking at these issues, you look at all these various things and you begin to put them together. Here, the Lord does it for us um, in awesome fashion because Hebrews 7 directly relates to Abraham and Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. And so let's just look at this quickly. Uh, it really is the whole chapter. So maybe we'll go through and we'll draw some principles. And then you as well, as you think through this now, uh, think about the point that Hebrews chapter seven is making about Christ, how that applies to tithing and what we're to take from that with respect to tithing. In Hebrews chapter seven, um, we're establishing, the writer, the author of Hebrews is establishing Jesus Christ as the consummate high priest. That Jesus Christ is authoritative over the priesthood of the Levites. Um, he is the supreme high priest and he's gonna form an argument to make that point, okay, in chapter seven. It says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of, of most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually, all right? Well, he's setting up now Melchizedek. Again, he goes back to Genesis 14. So before the law, now we're way after the law uh, and we're talking about um, Melchizedek. This is after the cross. This is in the church age. These are two, this is written to Jewish converts to Christianity who are in the church dispersed throughout the land and he's setting up now Melchizedek as this uh, priest of a different order. Look at verse four where he says, now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Adam gave a tenth of the spoils. So now you've got this principle of um, one under spiritual authority, tithing to one in spiritual authority, tithing to God, but one in spiritual authority. Verse five, indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, who uh, receive the priesthood and have a commandment to receive tithes from the people, according to the law, that is from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham, but he whose genealogy is not derived from them receives tithes from Abraham, uh, and blessed him who had the promises. So now I'm going to try to build this for you and try to make it as clear as possible that we have the, the order of Melchizedek, the priesthood of Melchizedek, who is outside his order, of the priesthood outside that of the Levites, that even Abraham tithed to him. So he's a superior spiritual authority that even Abraham tithed to Melchizedek and the Levitical priesthood set up by God for the children of Israel who came from the genealogy of Abraham, even the Levitical priesthood in the loins of Abraham, so to speak, tithed to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was greater than, if you will, Abraham, greater than 
the, the Levitical priesthood. Um, it says, verse 7, Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. So Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes from all of us, he's saying, listen, Levi receives tithes from all of us, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So I hope all well, that makes sense. Ask me questions if, if, if not. Verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Now, this is important because the priesthood is being changed. What tribe did Jesus come from? Tribe of Judah. So it wasn't of the tribe of Levi. So we're making the point that Jesus is a high priest. He's not a, he's the supreme priest. He is the eternal priest, prophet, priest, and king, right? But Jesus didn't come from the Levitical line. He didn't come from the Levites. He came from the tribe of Judah. So we're saying that Jesus Christ, the author is saying here that Jesus Christ is the supreme priest, but he's a supreme priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And according to the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek, having no genealogy of his own, was greater than the Levitical priesthood. And so Jesus Christ is greater than the Levitical priesthood himself, right? Because the Levites all paid tithes to Melchizedek. Abraham himself paid tithes to Melchizedek. So Jesus Christ is the supreme priest because he comes from the order of Melchizedek. Make sense so far? Yes, ma'am. And that's why it, he's making the point here that because Melchizedek, and there's a lot of speculation about this, about how this all um, applies and means, but El Melchizedek isn't said to have had a father or a mother, was, had no beginning, had no end. So he's making some application. He, he draws from the Old Testament this um, shadowy figure, you know, of Melchizedek with no beginning, no end, no mother, no father, but this... Um, obviously superior priesthood. And he's saying that Jesus Christ is likened to a priest from that kind of order. No beginning, no end, no father, no mother. He's eternal, he's God in the flesh. And Jesus Christ is a priest like that order. Um, and he uses the example of Abraham tithing to him to say that it was greater than the Israelite priesthood we have here. There's a lot that goes into some of those things that are said. Does that sort of make sense a little bit? Yes. Unknown, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Some believe, and this is where you'd have to study and, you know, think, and we won't know, uh, you know, until we get to heaven. But uh, some would say that Melchizedek is a theophany, that that was an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And so Christ is likened to this order of Christ. Uh, those things it would just take study, and, t and it's going to take God. <laughs> so there's some things we just won't know for sure until we get to heaven and find them out. But that's one thought, is that Melchizedek was a theophany, and another thought that he was just this figure out of the Old Testament with no genealogy, no history, no mother and father. And so the author of the letter of Hebrews just uses that as a, as a way to illustrate. Um, but yeah, so, yes? Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes, it's a word of God, right? And the word of God is all pointing back to this very issue. Yeah, very good. Okay, so he goes on now. He says, uh, it's evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of the fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies your priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And again, that's quoting that place. Uh, for uh, on the one hand, there is an annulling of the for former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. In one sense, those tithing laws to Levi, because there is another priest, another priesthood, that law in one sense was done away with and replaced now, he's saying replaced now with tithing to Jesus Christ. 
um, Jesus Christ is greater than the Levitical priesthood, greater than Melchizedek, but of the order of Melchizedek. And so it says, um, on the one hand, there's an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn, will not relent, you're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who was wholly harmless. The point, one of the points, several, that are being made here is that Jesus Christ, one of them, is that Jesus Christ is worthy of the tithe. We put away the tithe that was made to the Levite because we have a new high priest. We have a new priestly order. That command in one sense was put away because now we have a greater high priest. In a sense, he makes the point by using the tithe as an illustration that Jesus Christ is the greatest high priest, the supreme high priest, the consummate high priest, because we would tithe to Christ and not to the Levit Levitical priesthood. Uh, because Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, the Levites in the loins of Abraham, so to speak, tithed to Melchizedek. Because of all of us, we would have tithed to the Levites because all of us tithed to the Levites. That's a point being made here. I mean, they're currently would have been positioned to tithe the Levites because we would have tithed the Levites and because the Levites tithed to Abraham, so to speak, or in the loins of Abraham. And because the us, the Levites, and Abraham all would have tithed to Melchizedek, we tithe now to Jesus Christ because he is the supreme high priest. Make sense? It's, you just have to go through there piece by piece and a little difficult, read a couple of commentaries, uh, that'll help. So we're out of time, but here's a couple of points to leave you with. And then what I'll try to do is we'll get out um, a summary of all these things in sort of paper form that will help you. It'll give you a reference that if any, at any point this issue ever comes up again, uh, you can look through that and sort of re go through or rehash all these principles and points. Transcends circumstances, transcends covenant, transcends cultures, transcends eons, tithing taught before the law, under the law, after the law. Taught in the New Testament, never, never abrogated. Maybe we spend one more week answering some of these questions, but Christian giving above and beyond the tithe. The tithe then, from all that we have here, the tithe is commanded. That's a principle that we draw from all those different audiences, covenants, times, and circumstances as the tithe is commanded as an act of worship. The tithe then would be a 10% giving to be brought into the storehouse a 10% of your best, your first fruits. So that's where we get the idea that we tithe from the gross and not the net. And that the tithe applies to the Christian today. Christian giving then is part of the New Testament's expansion or clarifying of what we're to do with our possessions. Christian giving becomes then above and beyond the tithe that we're to give with a willing, cheerful heart. That we're to give out of an abundance of all that God has given us. Give as God has prospered us to give. Um, we take that collection, as Paul says, on the first day, on the day we gather together to worship the Lord. Um, all those principles would apply, and we'll try to get all those principles in paper form for you. Sorry to seem like we've sort of rushed through that. I'll decide, maybe you can give me some input whether we should take one more Sunday and just sort of clarify all those things out for you, what we've garnered from this. But clearly taught in the New Testament, taught under the law, taught before, so it applies, okay? We'll talk more. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time. Thank you again, Lord, just for how wonderfully clear and helpful your word is. What a sure guide for us, Lord, if we just uh, humble our hearts and uh, learn what it says and obey it. And thank you, Lord, for this uh, gift of, of tithing to us, God. It's a blessing to us because it sanctifies us. It teaches us, as you've said, to fear the Lord. It teaches us to humble ourselves and trust in you for your provision. And then, Lord, it just bolsters our faith. I've seen time and time and time and time and time again how you, Lord, have personally bolstered my faith um, by just providing for me uh, when I didn't know where the next 
check was going to come from. So I uh, thank you, Lord. You're gracious and merciful, and we worship you in this. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, and we'll have a service starting in just, okay, with preparatory.